Various European cultures came to be represented in England's American colonies. Beginning with the first permanent settlement at Jamestown in 1607, approximately 250,000 Europeans migrated to the colonies by 1700. By the outbreak of the American Revolution, the population of England's colonies in North America was approaching two and a half million. Most immigrants to the colonies were from England during the early period, but over time, immigrants began coming to America from other European countries. Since harvesting large crops requires a substantial workforce, the colonists adopted the practice of indentured servitude. Indentured servants were usually poor, unskilled laborers. They had limited economic opportunities in England. In exchange for passage to the colonies, they agreed to work for a certain number of years as servants. The number of years was decided upon at the beginning of the indenture. While indentured servants were contracted for a specific number of years, Africans were bound in chattel slavery, which was a lifelong condition for themselves and their descendants. As cash crops became profitable and colonists expanded the size of their land holdings, plantation owners eventually came to view African slaves as a more profitable and renewable source of labor. Slaves were transported from West Africa across the Atlantic under inhumane conditions. Since this trip was the second of three trips in a usual European commerce journey, it was called the Middle Passage. Scholars estimate that one out of every five slaves died during the Middle Passage, and that 12 and a half million African people were taken from their homeland. The first Africans arrived in the southern colonies in 1619. During the colonial period, approximately 250,000 Africans were forcibly enslaved and brought to the English colonies. The vast majority of these slaves were concentrated in the agriculturally intensive southern colonies, although all of the English colonies allowed and had slaves during the colonial period. Slaves came from many different African communities, and their cultures could vary greatly. Ripped from their homes and their families, they found it difficult to maintain cultural practices. So, Africans formed a new culture. It was a combination of their different cultures, but uniquely American, as evidenced in multiple practices that are still recognizable today. For example, the Gullah people, descendants of African slaves brought to regions of Georgia and South Carolina, developed a culture that honored African linguistic and cultural heritages from various groups, but also incorporated New World influences from the region. From this fusion, an English-based Creole language emerged, adopting words and grammar from African culture. Similarly, former Europeans in the New World developed a culture that was different from the cultures in their home nations. The colonies had always been somewhat independent of English control due to distance limitations, structure of the colonial governments, and the greater proportion of eligible voters in the colonies. The methods of colonial self-government that existed during the period of salutary neglect firmly established the tradition of independence that would later lead to revolution between England and her colonies. Salutary neglect was a British policy regarding control of its North American colonies. As long as the colonies remained loyal and committed to the economic growth of Britain, trade regulations and the control of colonial affairs would be moderately imposed. The political structure of each colony by the time of the Revolutionary War consisted of a governor and an elected legislature. The earliest of the elected legislatures, the House of Burgesses, had been established shortly after Jamestown's founding. Colonial legislatures, such as Virginia's, had long traditions of making local policies and were made up of locally elected colonists. Taxes were levied by these colonial representatives and established the tradition of local taxation by locally elected representatives. Many New England colonies had town meetings that met regularly for people to vote directly on public issues. In many colonies, the Church of England was the official church. The Great Awakening was a movement that challenged established authorities as the colonists questioned the Church of England as well as the authority of the British monarchy. The idea of the shared struggle that these ministers had spoken of 
was easily transferred to the shared struggle for independence that was beginning to unify the colonies. Sometimes the split was social, with wealthy church members often favoring traditional practices. The split was often geographic as well. Many in the southern colonies resisted change. Those in the northern areas of colonial America were more likely to favor the Great Awakening. <laughs>